So we are, we are in Women Matters in the end of February 2023. And we are starting with a check-in and give over to Beatrice. She already started before, and so I thought we <laughs> should all hear that. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, I'm calling in from New York this time because I seem to call from somewhere different every time. Um, I landed here, well, my body landed here. This is actually what I wanted to talk about. My body landed here. Hello, Alfred, I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my body landed here on Thursday morning early. There were many delays. It was actually snowing in Portland. So we were stuck on the tarmac for three hours and, and then get here until 4am and didn't get to sleep until 6am. Um, and it's now Monday. So that's five days or four days or something, but I feel my body or myself existing kind of like like not not all in one place um and I'm I'm experiencing myself landing still um in terms of like mind heart emotions conception of time temporality all of it it feels a little disparate right now and and part of that too is before I left I you know it in in five day or in four days, I was in five different locations. Ooh. <laughs> so <laughs> that'll do it to you. You know, I was I was um I spent four day four day weekend um in Washington State, um, in the forest at a, a kind of dance, dancing and playing board games and spending time with people in a cabin. And then I came home to Portland for one day. And then I came to New York. And then the first night I slept in one place, and the second night I slept in a different place. So <laughs> anyway, so I think it's, but I think that's interesting. I've been reflecting on it about the, about the body showing up in one place, but not feeling fully integrated or connected and what that experience is and what, how that works. Um, the other thing I've been thinking about, because that's what the question was um, as a potential topic. Um, I'm here working on my, uh, the morning machine project, which is, um, going to be an interactive experience about grief and mourning and we are currently in the process of prototyping different we're calling them machines and and the idea of machine not so much about you know technology or something made out of metal but machine being something that takes input and creates output that, that there's a transformation that occurs inside of a machine um and machine is apparatus. And so we are building machines that people can go through um, to have an experience, to be transformed, to, to have a different relationship to grief or to um, start to notice more capitalistic, patriarchal systems, societal systems around grief that are maybe not there to help you, but are rather you know co-opting you towards you know, being a cog in the wheel of the system rather than actually healing and processing grief. So that's the other thing I'm thinking about because that's what I'm working on right now. Um, we've had two sessions so far of a two and a half week workshop. So um, I haven't been here for a few weeks, so there's more updates than that, but I'll stop there because those I think are the two that feel, feel the most maybe interesting to talk about in the group. Um, I will pass to Monia. Yeah, I know your experience. And I remember when you wake up in the morning, do you know which side of the bed you can have to get out to off? <laughs> because I I had that, I, I couldn't place myself once. Where am I? When we came back from the States and we were in France and and I, I just I just in the morning, I just was disoriented completely. Yeah, I've been sick for, for three weeks. I had the ah. arthritis and a really bad cold, but not a uh, COVID, just ordinary virus, my husband as well. So we both coughed and I sort of turned back to the beige stage and 
I wasn't interested in it much. And I just couldn't get my synapses working. I was just sleeping a lot and trying to get well again. Now, to, this week, I'm feeling better. Um, yeah, and it's cold in Vienna. We have snow still, winter is still here. And that's, uh, yeah, we are all ready for spring and the squirrels and the uh, birds are just very busy collecting the nuts. The minute we put them outside on the bird feeder, it's gone. So it's just, uh, yeah, they are ready to start spring as well. Yeah, so that's about, I'm reading some urban fantasy. Uh, and this really gets my mind off what's happening in the world because, and in, in Austria, because I really would get depressed if I watched the news and yeah. Okay, that's about all I can share. Uh, Gertrud, I haven't heard from you in a long time. How come you travel a lot? Oh my God. Um... <laughs> It started with a 50th birthday in Donau Eschingen in the Black Forest, <laughs> and then go to Bern, the capital of Switzerland, where I visited a friend and a former and had coffee with a former former client of mine, which was really nice. We did an AI process in there when they freighted themselves. So as a startup. And um, then I had an appointment in Zurich, <laughs> was just going through the city a little bit and, and had that appointment in home again. And the next, uh, just washing and stuff and then go to, to Austria to visit my daughter. She had a consolation weekend, and so we were sitting in <laughs> for the uh, the two, eight and five year old, and that was really nice. I mean, through COVID, we didn't see each other much, in and so it was a very nice connection. So I really had this, yeah, grand children grandparents connection re re-established or maybe first time really established and and that was really really good so we couldn't even we could even bring them to bed and so we had almost a week there and came home washed again and went to Hanover to visit our middle daughter and the the youngest came from Hamburg. So we spent some time together and her boyfriend had a workshop, a seminar. So I stayed the week to, to be with her. She didn't want to be alone with the baby. So, yeah, and here I am. Yeah, and, and what I started, and I think I didn't tell anyone yet, or you yet, is that I started a fitness program. So to really rebuild muscles. And this is really interesting, like to get to know your body more and to get the, the exercises right. And yeah. And, and in Zurich, that was to, to scan my body for, for lean mass, fat, and wear in your body and things like that. So, so I did that. And at the same time, parallel to this, I'm, I'm also attending a nutritional program. It's called Wild, Wild Fit. And uh, this is, yeah. Yeah, they, every every week he says what we need to change or what he thinks is good to change and so to first to eat fruit as much as you can and and vegetables and then eliminate sugar 
all kinds of starch stuff, alcohol, nicotine, um, coffee, all this. So I'm, <laughs> so it's like, what do you call that? Oh, call that Hunderneuerung. Um, turnover a whole whole my whole body so and and this is really really great to do this a little bit challenging but still yeah no processed foods and things like that so but it's week by week so always like increase your water increase your <laughs> every week something else that's what i've been doing because I was at the doctor, that was parallel, but um, at the doctors, they told me that I have too, whole, uh, too high cholesterol, which I cannot, I mean, I eat very little animal products. And so it's, yeah, but I think it's in my genes because my grandmother and my mother, they had not Alzheimer's, but um, multi infarct um, dementia so it's like yeah maybe I should have to take care even more than others so that's so very much grandmother and my own health that was my main thing Heidi, you want to go next? Me or Victoria? I said Heidi. I, I didn't hear well. Go, go ahead, Heidi. Um, I'm having trouble with my internet right now. I'm in a cafe. Just um, go okay. ahead and I'll, I'll try to okay. fill in in a minute. Thanks. I, I have the little doggy here. I don't know if you see, see her. She was in punishment this morning because she escaped and it didn't come. And then she came, then I put her in her box. And so now she is good. She tries to, to how do you say, to calm me. <laughs> so, yeah, what is my, how am I here? I had a very nice uh, encounter this uh, today, one and a half hours with another group, which is once a month, which it's not that I had organized it, but I, I participate very deep. Um, it's not even conversations. I don't even know what, what to call it, but very nice. It was very inspiring. And then it has rained finally overnight. And then it was sun. And in the sun, we had lunch outside. I, together with the Brazilians who are here. And... Um, now it's raining again, and I'm glad about it, because if it doesn't rain now and in March, then good night for summer. I'm concerned very much about what is happening in the world, that the very gentle souls were very sensitive and, um, and kind, as uh, it happened with uh, Clemens Arve. He has killed himself because he couldn't withstand the, the accusations and the wrongdoings of the of the media. They tried to destroy him completely. And at the end, how do you call this psychological uh, violence uh, against him? And he, he, how do you say, he gave way to this. He couldn't live anymore. So in an environment. Who are you talking about? Clemens Arve. He is uh, Austri Austri Austrian. And he was uh, it's a very, very gentle soul and is uh, very much into um, a long time into the uh, environmental, into nature and everything, you know, really, really nice. And his, let's say, error was that in the beginning, 2020, he, because of his profession, um, could see 
what they were planning with the vaccinations and already before they were rolled out, he said he tried to, 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 to he, he published a book about it. It's not the only book, but that was in that time. And he, he tried to be very uh, rational about what, what, what the risks are and if you should do it, if you should not do it. And that immediately uh, drove him into the attention of the so-called fact checkers and into the um, denigration and, um, uh, and, and destruction of, of um, the media and everything. And I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I followed him sometimes. He has had a, a YouTube channel. I don't know if it's still there. He, he just gave up. And that's um, also the, I heard, I think Jordan Peterson, he said the worst um, punishment you can get is if you are punished for something which you did really well. And, you know, and I feel that's the case with him. He was really trying to help people to get them clear without, um, how do you say, um, without, taking parts into, without offending, without, uh, God, uh, how do you take only one side, but always uh, trying to, to, to mediate and trying to, to come, you know, to a deep understanding of what the things are. And uh, yeah, that's enough what I said, but I was very, very shocked about that, that the most gentle souls and the people who try to help other people get destroyed for that and yeah because they cannot they have not the psychological strength to just say okay i don't care what uh, what a shit storm is and on social media and so on so that is my um my situation at the moment a sort of mourning that connects with your topic beatrice a mourning about people who just are not fit to live in a surrounding which is uh, in the present world, let's say. Um, yeah, so I find interesting this uh, topic you said, you are with your body somewhere, but the rest is not yet there. And Monia, you said you don't know where to get out of the bed, or even to me it happens when, for instance, this morning, I remembered a dream and I didn't know, did I, was it in a dream? Was it not in a dream? Where, where am I now? And so that could be a topic we, we talk about if you, if you like, if your experiences in that and how you handle this. Is this okay for topic? Okay, so start. <laughs> Let's hear Victoria. Yeah. Yeah, she, she has not done the check-in, but you can combine it together. Well, it's, it's a good topic. Um, can you hear me? You couldn't go nearer to the microphone. I don't know where the microphone is. I'm, I've never used this before. Yeah, put it in front of your, your mouth. Is this right better? Yeah. No, it's the other object to your left. There's another, go up the chain. Yeah, that one. Is this better? No. Can you hear me? Yeah, you, we no. can hear you. Oh, well, I guess I can talk louder. I can't hear myself. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm in a cafe. Um, <laughs> I don't know where I am because I uh, I just attended morning mass at the church, and then at ten o'clock, well, and then in half an hour, I'm re going back to the church for a funeral of a um, a really beautiful woman. I didn't know her very well, but I, I just knew her from the church. She was a Eucharistic minister, but she was the kind of person I wished I could be. She was very elegant and um, gentle. And I don't know, She I just loved her, even though I barely knew her. So um, when I saw that she had passed away, I uh, was planning to attend her funeral. And then uh, the, I, the priest I saw, he said, he said, oh, um, are you going to be playing the violin? Because she was a contrabass, she played contrabass in an orchestra, which is unusual for a woman. 
also she was African American and she was um I guess she was about 90 just now when she died. So so she was kind of a, a trendsetter as an African American woman to be playing contrabass in an orchestra. <laughs> Um, she's really interesting. Anyway, so when he when he at, when the priest asked me yesterday if I was going to be playing the violin, I suddenly thought, oh, I'd love to play the violin because we always talked about music and string playing. So I last night I contacted the um, music director of the church and asked if she could fit me in to play something. And um, so I'm going to do Schubert's Ave Maria. She had requested that for the funeral, and um, the cantor was going to sing it, but she said, "Oh, it'd be so nice on violin." So, so anyway, that, that's why I'm in transition here. I'm in a cafe that has a very loud bird. I don't know if you can hear the bird. <laughs> it's kind of fun to have a bird in the cafe. Um, so yeah, so everything is sort of. I, I feel almost all the time, like what you said, Heidi, about the dream. So this will be my um, contribution to theme for the moment. Um, my dreams have been so vivid uh, ever since my mother died that they're so incredibly vivid that I really don't know if I'm waking or sleeping. And, um, and, and I have that kind of thing all the time. During the day, I'll have a flashback to something and then I'll think, well, wait a minute that didn't actually happen <laughs> that wasn't a dream and it's it's really disorienting and I think I think I'm overloaded with um I think the stress and then the emotional processing of the still all the family stuff and I I don't know I just feel like I'm very overwhelmed and overloaded so there there's I think my brain is I don't know I mean I just feel like I'm having difficulty discerning what's real and what's not but but then i'm thinking i've lately i've been thinking maybe the dreams are more real than my than my daily life because they're so much more dramatic and my daily life is just kind of you know sort of going along very in a very kind of ordinary well it's not that ordinary this morning because so i've got a lot going on but um so i've been curious lately if in fact I should pay more attention to my dreams than to what's going on in my conscious life because it it might give me more clues as to where I'm supposed to be doing my kind of spiritual work or whatever you want to call it or psychological work or processing that um and the death theme is interesting too I'm taking because of Beatrice <laughs> I'm, I'm taking a whole bunch of courses right now um on death um, from a Buddhist perspective, and it's really interesting. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about death for that reason, and um, I have all kinds of stuff I want to share with Beatrice, but she's so overloaded right now that she's asking me to, to store it up for some future time. So I'm wondering also the relationship between death, thinking about death, and people who have passed. So in other words, like like thinking about the past and and what's going on in the dream our dreams so if there's some correlation there too i know monia's a specialist in the lucid dreaming and stuff so maybe there's something there too okay so i'm gonna mute myself now for the moment thank you one of our um in preparation for our workshop we have been doing um, online Zoom calls with our collaborators, um, spotlighting a different collaborator each time to talk about a topic that they are particularly well-versed in or interested in. And one of our collaborators um, wanted to talk about time and how we perceive time and how we experience time and how different cultures and different people experience time differently. And that it's not as clear cut as we are, you know, trained to believe, um, and, and, but he started the call, um, talking about a dream that he had, where it was this very surreal, fantastical dream, but he ended, he ended up, um, seeing his grandfather and having this, this intergenerational connection with his grandfather, and it felt kind of like the passing of a torch or the passing of, legacy um in this dream and 
I'm still, I'm still kind of wrapping my head around what he was talking about, but his, his theory was that um, both in dream state, but also in, in our perceptions of time, that maybe there is a way to connect across generations or through two ancestors or two other people's memories or to experience or how, I mean, even in the sharing of memories, we have now given, you know, if I tell a story about something and you remember it, it is now your memory as well. And I feel like I'm not being very eloquent about it, but also because I, I feel like I haven't quite gotten clarity on what he was saying. Um, but what you're, what you were just saying reminded me of that, of, of, of the dream state and perception of time and how can we connect with people, um, both living and dead, um, in our memory, in our dreams, in our consciousness or unconsciousness, I guess. I see Monia thinking very deeply and I want to, I want to know what you're thinking. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking back and I have been studying dreaming for decades now and finally I gave up. Um, my dreams are still rather clear and I write them down every morning. And sometimes they're just uh, yeah, pleasant. And then at other times I have the same old routine of being too late or missing a train or probably going to miss a train. So it's the white rabbit of Alice in Wonderland. I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. But sometimes now I manage to draw myself out of dreams that are unpleasant. And maybe this is an, uh, a success or an advantage, I don't know. But on the other hand, um, hmm. I'm trying, as I told you before, we started a recording uh, that I'm reading urban fantasies and this is one of the topics that turns up in many, many, many books and time. There are time travelers and uh, they're quite, uh, I, uh, what is it? Uh, it's a series about time travelers. And yeah, it's always, when you do that, you travel at a risk. Oh, at many risks, let's put it this way. And I have finally agreed to being as old as I am and settling where I am. And yeah, uh, not getting or avoiding to be upset by the media and uh, this is about what we are uh, talking in our Viennese saloon about uh, uh, coincidentally, as we also talked at uh, yesterday, at the, at the, uh, two days ago at the Brunnen, about which taboos are necessary and which taboos are just a block in your development. So these are the topics, um, yeah. And I, I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm not, I'm still curious, but I'm not push, I'm not pushing myself as much as I did. And listening to Gertrude, uh, because I've been uh, losing weight now for the past, since October, I think I started very slowly, nothing, uh, just by stopping to eat at around five o'clock in the afternoon and having breakfast at nine the next day. 
so this interval fasting. And yeah, and if I don't lose as much weight as I want to, okay, so that's okay with me as well. Maybe my body is just feeling best at this uh, weight. Um, so I'm wondering when I when I listened to Gertrud, I'm, I was wondering why are we always trying to improve the way we are? And um, but maybe this is just being over eighty and you finally give in. That's the way it is. Um, but I'm very much aware where I am and how I am. And so this is this kind of Buddhist training really, uh, I can recommend to everyone. It's actually, it's not a religion, it's psychology. And uh, yeah, uh, of course, traveling a lot as you all did, uh, gets you disoriented. And I have been here at Vienna now for years. So finally, I know where I am. Um, yeah, that's about all I can say. But I, I really have to admit that I gave up on unraveling what and why we dream. And yeah, so I, I can live with that. There was a time when I really was, I have a library of books about dreaming and yeah, whatever they say, it doesn't apply to me. So everybody probably dreams her own way. Yeah, that's about all I have to say. I'm just rambling on, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was thinking when you talked here at the end, that's individuation, not uh, getting away from what other people say you should do and, wish, and, and so on. I feel this in a certain sense, and especially with eating, uh, I try to find out what I can eat and what I can't because of the reaction of my body. And then the, the person says, oh, you shouldn't eat wheat, you shouldn't eat sugar. I, I eat only a little sugar, not so much. And you shouldn't eat this because cholesterol, and that's a little high, but that's not really high. And uh, so everybody has a different idea about what you should eat. And I got so confused. And then I thought, lately, I allow myself to have certain things which I really like. I like cream, whipped cream. And so I eat it often, you know, when I go into the bar uh, with my doggies go around. And <clears throat> yeah, you shouldn't eat that. But why do we have this, um, this tendency to self-punishment? If we, when I hear you cannot eat this anymore and then this anymore, it goes, no, why? Because somebody said you should only eat meat, only uh, ketonic uh, diet, diet. The other say you shouldn't eat uh, milk stuff and cheeses. The other say, oh, you shouldn't eat uh, wheat and all, you know, uh, carbohydrates and so on. And who is right? I think at the end, we need to find our own way of uh, finding out uh, what is good and what is not good. And I am so far that my body tells me really strongly when it doesn't like certain things. So, uh, you know, uh, maybe it depends on age. I don't know. But uh, Gertraud is not much younger than me, uh, a little, I think. But <laughs> I, I feel like uh, sort of giving up too on these things, you know, and trying to find my own way, which, by the way, I always did. And so that's my uh, idea to, to this. And my world, oh, I, I think I told you, I always looking forward to the night because that's a moment uh, where many things happen. And when I stay awake, my ring tells me in the morning that I was not awake. I'm completely convinced that I'm awake. But then I look, when I go to the bathroom, I look at the clock. And the next time I look, it's two hours later. So maybe I was not completely awake. But I enjoy these, uh, these states of consciousness, which are, are different, you know, which are, 
I, I realize that I sort of am thinking, think it thinks me, let's say, but I'm not insisting on thinking, oh, I have to do it, blah, 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 very rarely. And this is a new state for me uh, of, um, of passing the night, let's say, in a different state of consciousness. And I, I enjoy it. And I don't know where I am. If I'm asleep, I know that I'm in bed. That's the only thing. But <laughs> uh, what I really learned for the last couple of years is uh, how to stop uh, going into a negative circle that you think about something and you so I really learned how to stop that and because I know it's no good and now I found that in a book as well so I'm confirmed that's the right <laughs> way uh, and it it amazes me that you can write books about everything uh, and I have no need to do that but it's um a waste of energy just to spend your nights like this and and yeah, this is real. so. I usually do it with a mantra. I just put the mantra in, and that gets me out of this circle, vicious circles. Okay, get out. You are. Unused. Yeah, actually, uh, for me, it's an adventure, and I've never done any diets. Um, I, I let. Uh, I'm a nutritionist. I studied nutrition, and I've led uh, for. 20 years or so, were, uh, weight loss programs and things like that without dieting. And for me, it's it's like really an adventure and you don't know next week what's, what is he going to say. And it's easy. So I've been fasting, um, not fasting calories, but like to say okay before um, Easter for example to to not drink alcohol or coffee and not eat sugar so so it's not like very demanding for me it's more an adventure and I'm curious what comes next so so there is no um it, it's it's not so much to improve myself, more to find my way. And and let's see, this is no diet in in a in a narrow sense. It's it's more like coming back to to find your way, like you said, Heidi, to find your natural way to to do it. And so maybe he says, okay, now. <laughs> we go back and I don't know so it's it's 90 days challenge how he says uh, he he names it so I'm I'm very fine with it and um about the uh, and and the 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 fitness program is more this is about something that we do 30 minutes per week to strengthen your muscles and in a very specific way. And I, I want to, to learn that. It, yeah, self-improvement. I don't know. Um, well, I've seen in the, in the um, nursing home that I was in the, uh, in the leadership team, there were so many people that broke their legs and then they had to come to us. So it's it's more like to, and there's also a reason my daughters became, uh, got their children pretty late. So they're 35. And uh, so it's, it's like, I want to see them grow and, and, and be an active part in that. So it, it's it feels right at the moment and I've never done sports I've never only going for a walk or so and this was tempting to say okay you can you can do that uh, just for once or twice a, a week for 30 minutes and that's it so that's that's really tempting 
I do. And I started, I started to, so you have to learn it, how to do it well and, and to have the right weights and yeah. So bend strengths and all this. And when it comes to dreaming, um, I'm, I'm not a good person to remember my dreams. So I can, I can get when I had vivid dreams because there's something happening and I can recall a little bit, but it's very, very rare that I can remember and write them down. So, um, the so do you teacher, notice the, the mood that the dream gets you into for the rest of the day or for the morning? Sometimes I'm puzzled, like, so what was that or something like that. But I've, I, I don't recall dreams that that uh, pull me down. So I, I don't recall that. And I, I've been doing Ishaya's Ascension meditation for twenty three years now, and what. This is still in my <laughs> in my awareness. They say dreaming is to clear the nervous system. So like to and and when you're doing that meditation, or I think with most meditations, you're just so there are thoughts coming up, there are some images coming up or so, and this is similar to dreaming and, and they can be singular. So you have a stream, <laughs> you have like something happening in a, a way that we see it here. And it could be that it's just intermingling many different things. And she was talking about um a red a, a horse in a red he, she was dreaming about or that was coming up in the meditation a horse with a red uh dress washing dishes <laughs> and, <laughs> and then she was explaining uh that it took her some time to to get that apart so three different things that were just intermingled together and to make sense of it it's um she says you don't have to put your nose into the exhaust it's it's like really getting the the nervous system clear and it's a healing process and so yeah and if you're meditating or sleeping so you should do either one of them for eight hours or a mixture or whatever um then you you have the chance that that it clears itself after some time so i'm i'm just thinking okay <laughs> another clearing whatever that might be so mm -hmm. That's me. Yeah, I wanted to answer to that. What I'm hearing is more that you are doing prevention and not self-improvement. No, then that's, I agree totally because I saw my mother like stiff like this in the last years. And I said, I don't want to arrive there. And I start every day, 10 minutes with the with weights, very low weights. And I'm a couch potato, you know, I'm not really liking movement and uh, especially when it doesn't make sense when I go and cut the olive trees prune the olive trees that at least makes sense but it's different you know and so I want also confirm that um, the right way of movement is really uh, uh, reactivating a body about 10 or 15 years ago I had a half a year a private uh, personal trainer who worked with me only an hour a week and the body was incredible afterwards I mean during this time it developed in a way really great and um, 
now I had a period about half a year ago or even a little longer where I was completely stiff like this, you know, and I had two sessions with the osteopath and then I decided, no, I have to do it myself. And so every day I, I did exercises. You know what is good to when you when you have nobody to, to reach your shoulders to for massage with a tennis ball against the wall continuously. And I felt it went better and better and better. And so we can take responsibility for our health and not say, oh no, I'm a blah, blah, blah. no. So I'm committed to to do the same thing to to try to to become as much as possible autonomous about health questions, you know, and I might need a doctor every now and then, but I've never seen many doctors in the last 30 years, let's say. <laughs> okay, and about the dreaming state and the not dreaming state or in between, I really enjoy it. That's like, also when you say the horse, which is wash, a red horse washing dishes, that's also so fascinating when you try to, in the dream, it seems also normal to you what you dream and then try to translate it into, you think it doesn't make sense at all, you know, <laughs> but I enjoy this state so far to me. Beatrice. Oh, I was typing something you said. <laughs> um. I had a thought and I forgot it. So I'm going to mute for the moment and try to remember it. And then I will return if I remember it. In the meantime, someone else can talk. I guess Victoria is on the road again or back to church. Yeah. Well, sort of wraps it up. Yeah, Todd, you're muted. Yeah. yeah, she said she had to go half an hour. In half an hour. Out. And I think that's over what oh the things making sense in a dream and not making sense in real life reminded me of a um exercise we did on the project once um which was called impossible stage directions and the assignment was to write you know in the way that stage directions say you know exit stage left or the person places a cup on the table or whatever actions right um but to write a stage direction that is physically impossible but that represented an experience of grief so some you know someone is crying on stage and floods the entire stage and it becomes a tsunami that goes on over the audience or something like that or um you know, someone's eating, we, we talked a lot about lasagna, the idea that people bring casseroles, you know, and, and food when you, when you're grieving, and that lasagna was something that a lot of us had experienced. And so, you know, the huge lasagna on the table, and someone devours the whole thing, you know, or the, the excess of the food or things like that. Um, but, but it is, amazing these images I mean in these impossible stage directions or in dreams like they're I mean I'm not finding a particular uh significance to the horse in the red dress but but some other example like that um kind of distills metaphorically distills an emotion or an experience you know in a way that that is harder to do in real life if that make, because of gravity, because of reality, because of, you know, object permanence, et cetera. Um, so there, there is some, I think there is something powerful there. I mean, I also am listening to you, Gertrude, about the don't put your nose in the exhaust. Um, about what? Oh, don't put your nose in the exhaust. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but I'm also interested. It, it's, it's, that's an interesting comment because it's it is a cleansing but i think sometimes it tells you maybe what you've been processing that you didn't realize you were processing she didn't say don't she said you don't have to mm. that it right. works yeah yeah and you can be interested and analyze it <laughs> yeah sure
So ladies, let us come to a sort of summary. Today, I felt it was a little bit like going to all parts. <laughs> so how can we find what we said together? Is there a common theme which we could use? <laughs> when you said prevention, sorry, Ammonia, mm -hmm. I don't oh, know. Oh, that's all right. I just, I just was uh, knowing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> knowing nothing. Yeah, that's good. Get that prevention. Yeah, when you said prevention, I thought like sleeping enough or meditating enough. So, like to get my body into resting state enough and then let it do its work and i can be interested in it and i can analyze what's happening but it does its work anyway <laughs> mm -hmm. right. because when i'm sick uh, when i sleep enough then i get well better and sooner yeah, yeah. without my mind of course i yeah. get some cough syrup and when I was in this um, nursing home leadership team for, I was in charge for four nursing homes. Um, then I, I woke up in the middle of the night with my heart like pounding. And it was always like every day there was a catastrophe of some sort. And, and, and so I, I, and I had to sit up in order to calm down my, my, my heart. And at that time I learned to ascend this ascension meditation. Mm -hmm. And I realized when I was in that state and, and, and then ascended that my heartbeat went down and in the morning I was not groggy. I could just yeah, as if I had slept eight hours. So it was not so, so important how long I was awake during the sleep, but if I replaced this with meditation and, and um, actually this, yeah, prevented me from burnout. Mm. I mean, there were so many, <laughs> I could tell you stories. There were so many things happening or you said, oh my God, and, and you're responsible and you're always with one foot in the, in jail. Um, and I don't know, have a salmonella on one of the stations and mm -hmm. first thing is kitchen, of course. <laughs> so, and, and then you can uh, prove that it was not the kitchen, but but just all this happening, um, it really could have wrecked me. It could have wrecked my nervous system. And, and, and to do this, and then sometimes have dreams and whatever, but I just said either sleep or <laughs> meditation. So uh, uh, I guess we also come back to the topic of resilience because when Heidi talked about Clemens Arridge, mm -hmm. it's also about resilience. Mm -hmm. And I definitely would now like to see Beatrice's pants. After <laughs> 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 the glimpse. And <laughs> oh, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. Good color. A good color. Yeah. To give you yeah. energy. <laughs> Great. They are uh, Christmas pajama pants <laughs> <laughs> with Star Wars characters on them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Good. So we decided we don't know, but still something we do know by getting into stillness or into calmness and in, in, in getting in connection with ourselves. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I heard uh, how to care for your nervous system. Mm -hmm. or tune in and autonomy and individuation being mm -hmm. being being you or right. finding right. what right. that looks like what what how to take care of yourself yourself 
Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> Huge program. Yeah. <laughs> okay. A day is filled. <laughs> okay, girls. A nice evening. And have nice dancing and whatever you do in New York. And you yeah. too. Nice uh, uh, nipote. What is nipote? Uh, grandchildren. And whatever yeah. you, you are doing. Yeah. So a friend of mine who is also 81, we went to school together. She's now becoming grandmother of twins. And it's her first grandchildren in next. Mm. Next. Only now. Days. Yeah, and she's doing hantel training. I had it 25 years ago, and I'm grateful for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with boys, it's always later. Yeah. So let's do hand every day. Okay, uh, oh. <laughs> it's resilient. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.